I, I love it in that man. stream thing. Okay. And I'll tell you. Yeah, okay, so yeah. We're live. We're live. Okay, cool. In full effect. But I read so many of these comics in pieces. Like, oh, I read issue four, and then two years later, I read issue two. And yeah. yeah. All right, most of the comic consumption is kind of like that. Back issues, you know, that's right. how it works. Reading that thing from beginning yeah, to when end, sit down. Like halfway through, <clears throat> hands up in the seat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's talk about like taking like your your pencil to another level. Yeah. What, what issue? All the city stuff is berserk. What issue is uh is your your cover in? Or what issue is it? Like what happens in that one? That's funny. I don't even know. Because I've read them all. <laughs> like I read them all in order on screen. Right. Need to dig it out. And see. Is there like a through line through the whole series? Like go back to his first. Oh, I don't stuff, know about or... that. That's the thing, though. All of those issues, like I read in Spotty. Exactly. I, I need yeah. To sit down and read them yeah. all in, in one way because this story surprised me with some of the twists and turns. Where it's like, oh man, that's really good. Like there were things that were like, okay, that's entertaining, and then they would have more meaning, like or something like yeah. where a character that was just one sidekick yeah. dies or changes or whatever, and it's like, oh yeah, like there's motive, you know, like. If, very clear motivations yeah. happen and stuff, so I was real impressed by all of that. But uh, that all cover, it's giant, right? Yeah. It's like this big. And I'm looking at it, and it's tight pencils only. And we've seen this pencil a million times. It's crazy to me that he inked on there. I know we, we said that. Yeah. Because the pencils are so, they're not just tight, they're also like weighted and stuff. They are. Like they're really considered. It's almost like the pencil drawing is this elaborate, beautiful piece. And then I feel I'm going to go to Things are obviously sure. kind of equally impressive, super tight and neat and everything. But I don't know how you pencil like that and then go, all right, nobody will ever see that. Drive the pages like two, three times. Yeah, it's sick, man. The issue, the issue that I uh, did the cover for, it's the one with the birds. Yeah, that bird sequence is amazing. You see these flock of seagulls, essentially. Okay. Like, 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 <laughs> what, with the haircut? <laughs> just, just swarm him, and he's got like a little parasol. So he's trying to he's bending yeah. them off a little bit. And it addresses the exact issues that we brought up with that yeah. Brian Talbot piece from the Mobius thing, where it's about the overlap and stuff. Because you could still, like, a lot of people, they misunderstood what the fuck we were saying. Because it's like, to be a depth, you need some overlap. And people are like, the birds, and how orderly birds fly. And it's like, <laughs> you're missing the fucking point. You can still create an orderly yeah. shape, but have overlap happen. And he does it. And he's drawn these, there might be, there might be a hundred birds, a panel. All different viewpoints, all different angles. Like he's never copy paste. Like right. if we have procreate and you're doing your roughs, draw one bird and then multiply mm -hmm. that throughout, change your perspectives. There's none of that. He doesn't know how to do that kind of shit. And then the parasol just gets more and more tattered. I think he's <laughs> shaking and cutting stuff off, and you could follow. So there's just birds. It's negative space essentially. There's that yeah. many birds, and you could follow. The trail of the swords through birds <laughs> yeah, and yeah. blood spatter and stuff. You could follow the exact like swoop of his knife blades as uh, the the birds' heads are getting chopped off and things. And then of course the the end boss there is like a plucked. <laughs> it's the size of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you ever read that one where it's like a graphic novel and the entire thing is cowboy, cowboy spinning a stick with two oh, chains yeah. and it's just. Like it's that seat, and it's like over and over, and like, but you're like it's a whole issue. mesmerized. But yeah, it's like it's like maybe fifty pages. Yeah. It, it, it's exhausting me to look at like one of those panels in a big fight scene. If he has those two where he's just mowing through a hundred people, mm -hmm. and they're all drawn, they're all very different, different costumes, different works. Yeah, it was pretty inspiring. So it looks like the the audio isn't great. They have no. the the splitter, okay, mm -hmm. and and all of that connected in there, man. So, uh, I, I would I would say maybe the move would be to, to pull out to pull, to pull out that splitter. Okay. okay. Pop in pop in a set, and then just try to position the set like the guy who's over here trying to get get Tom in the mix. This is a bird's nest. It is a bird's nest, but what can you do? I'm, ready to I'm not it. sure which one I am. Uh, yeah, we got to figure that out. To or plugging in. Yeah, I always think the move with this is that the um, the off mic, like the fourth mic, is us. 
that fourth mic needs to be like muffled in some way that's going to protect it from well, any sound. Yeah, and that ain't even the issue. No, no, no. It just it's just too much information. Mm -hmm. All right, this is the two mics. My nerves. Okay, plug, plug that into the, the jack, and the dude over here will just kind of be responsible. All right, you're in. We're in. Check, check, check. So I'm no longer plugged in. Correct. But this thing picks up signal or no? I mean, it's picking up for the video, but yeah. like... Hey, Tom okay. or Ed yeah. or somebody, I'm going to pull your mic out of the way. Yeah, hook it up, Jimmy. But you'll be... You'll be on here. So it's... um. It's not picking up so great for the stream, but it'll pick up for the video. Yeah, yeah, this has nothing to do with, with the stream. With okay. the stream. Yeah, sounds great now. So I'm just eye candy now. No, you're, <laughs> you're on. <laughs> you're on. It's all good. I, uh, I booked a trip to Japan, Jimmy. When are you going? November 12th through December 10th. That's exciting. Yeah, and I think Uncle Jeff Darrow is going to be there for that, that, for that November wow. leg. Yeah. yeah, we already got plans, man. <laughs> I'm I'm beating the I'm racing the clock because I had to uh I had to re up my renew my passport, so that's in the works. And uh, I saw that the average keep it up high, yeah, keep it up high. So this isn't this isn't like uh, with this. It's this the phone is very sensitive, but the computer isn't. So you could keep it up like literally under your titty. Well, I'd be a hundred times louder than you two. Huh? I'll be a hundred times louder than you two. Ah, whatever. Um. But uh, what was I about to say? You're racing the clock. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the average time for somebody to get the renewal is like 22 days, and wow. the trip is 40 something days away. So, I think, I think uh, I'll make it happen. But uh, when you go through Expedia, yeah. and, I, and I would encourage you to come out uh, in uh, November to participate in some of that shit, because I'm bringing all the recording stuff um, for 27 nights and the two plane tickets, like. Well, one plane ticket. Um, it's twenty six hundred bucks and change. It's less than a hundred dollars a day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because when you get an excessive amount of time, uh, and the plane ticket, that's the that's the that's the gimmick with them, dude. Like, if you just got the hotel, it might be one hundred dollars more expensive uh, for just the hotel without the plane ticket. But if you when you get the plane ticket, you get the hotel and you get a big block of time. There's a week of free accommodations. Are you staying in there. the same place the whole time? Yeah. Where at? Uh, it's JR Metz East in Shibuya, and the value there, like I stayed there the last piece of my uh, last tour yeah. in Japan, and you go into the basement, and it's the subway to oh, get yeah, to Narita thing, Airport, yeah. so you don't have to go through Shibuya Crossing and all that shit. You just literally go downstairs, hop the fucking train, and go to Narita Airport. There's going to be a kayfabe effect on uh, airline tickets to Japan. <laughs> Some fan staying in your hotel with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, wasn't the I just wondered the neighborhood. <laughs> you know what? Uh, shit, we had 15, 20,000 20, subscribers like when we went, when I went the first time and I met, I met five people. Like five people recognized me and the cool shit was there was somebody with me every time. Mm -hmm. So like H <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, so HB was, was with me two times, man. My homeboy from the block. And like, dude, are you at Piscor? And I'm like, well, yes, I am. Man. I'm like, looking cool in front of my homie and shit like that. That's great. And then uh, the uh, the dude who brought me out was this guy called Pun P, and he's a famous Japanese rapper. He was on NHK. That's the same station as uh, Man Ben. And he did a performance this one night, and it was a night when I think the typhoon was happening, so everybody was indoors, everybody was watching TV and shit. And then uh, he and I went out, probably not going to Broadway, and uh somebody like recognized me and shit he was so mad because he was just <laughs> on tv in japan and shit mm -hmm. but then like we were playing a game and and when he and i were together three people recognized me three people recognized him throughout like That's a fun this, game. This, this, <laughs> this, this day but he gets the edge up because like when people recognize him they fell on the ground like it was uh -huh. chicks you yeah. know like and they fell on the ground cry ah like inconsolable uh -huh. so stoked the Beatles. oh yeah this this sounds like uh jackie the joke man and rodney dangerfield where it's like, why didn't they recognize me <laughs> <laughs> yeah man 
Yeah. So that's going on. Uh, Jimmy, if you want to do a Funny Pages movie review for uh, next session, I could I could hook you up with yeah, that, man, that because there's some good stuff. Like there's shit that like when we were watching it, I was like, listen. I'm not going to be able to sleep if I don't say it to somebody. So, 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 so I'm doing a couple, a couple of pieces. Like there's this one part where there's like this, the, at the climax, there's this inking thing going down. And the jargon in the movie is really pretty good. Oh, that's good. But, but like you and I, would re- like we would recognize like, su- like subtleties. Like there's a part where, you know, this guy worked for Image. And when they show the comic and they're looking through the credits for his name, it's so clearly a continuity comics indicia that, that, that they're kay, that they're kayfabe. And when they're looking through the comic, it looks crusty bunker, you know, look like a Tom yeah, Greenberg yeah. megalith, but they call it image, you know? Hilarious. And even when they pull it out of the box, it's just, there's no image comic that feels like that. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's almost like a THB. It's kind of thick. It's and it's got a, that classic, like thicker glossy stock. I'm like, that doesn't even look like it. But, but when they're doing the inking demo at the end, after all this good jargon and, and back and forth, um, you see the hand doing the inking and they're using a C lettering nib with a flat edge. And I'm like, well, you know, like the doll yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, this is in my mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This out loud. I'm putting, I'm putting myself in check just like, because I know, I know the feedback, right? Like I've, I've drawn a guitar with too many frets uh, right? yeah, yeah. and that mm-hmm. type of shit. So I'm just like, yeah. you know, I'll just let this slide. The only reason I really paid attention is because they did so much good. Yeah. You know, but then I'm like, is Terry Zwig off a producer or something on that? It's a Klausian movie. I, I didn't see his name no, anywhere. I, so. I read but, or I, I heard a review of it, and Zwig off was mentioned, and I was okay. like, "Oh, did he? Is this one of his movies?" And I looked it up, and I didn't see his I name anywhere. I mean, it looks like they're going it. for that, totally. like the, the ad campaign and everything. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought too. It's it's fully it's like, you know, Uncle Dan Klaus. Did you say no first? <laughs> did, did you say no before Johnny Ryan and Rick Aldergott were were doing art for this thing? Because that's the other thing. Did you just like see the see the kids art and they're like oh that's John, that's johnny ryan and then they're going through other pages and like oh, okay that's rick alter got like you could you could you could identify this stuff the the le- lettering on the credits and shit like like as a name producer this and that it's clearly pete bag i feel like we should be getting paid for this spot <laughs> i know <laughs> but we'll do a proper proper review like i could send it to you and you watch it over the weekend yeah, or something yeah, I actually looked it up on the various streaming stuff i have access to and i had to yeah. i had to buy it so i just haven't yet okay is it playing anywhere here I don't even know what theaters are open yeah. anymore. Like Squirrel Hill would be the theater yeah, I would man, guess I would, you yeah. might find it at. Yeah, but I, I, I haven't looked. Yeah, I haven't seen. I feel like you're always over in that neighborhood, man. Because when yeah. I go, when I go get ramen, the 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 guy at the ramen board is like, I saw Tom. Oh, yeah. I saw Tom and his kids. <laughs> yeah. I think what other comics news? I uh, I rented a storage space this week and moved half my collection into it. Yeah, that was smart. Yeah. you're up in your game is it is it I temper, temp controlled out of a storage yeah spot. It's, it's climate controlled sick and uh, i cataloged everything that went in nice. so like now half of my cat half of my collection is like cataloged and yeah. databased and can be searched by artist and writer and just like what, what's the app it, it's just an excel it's a spreadsheet nice it's a spreadsheet nice yeah it's uh it, that was most of my week was moving that stuff and it's completely changed my everything that's cool. my workroom is just full Thank, yeah. thanks to all the k favors in the mail right. <laughs> i've got about six boxes i think eventually that storage space you know what i was thinking is we should uh maybe have a cartoonist k fabe uh collection at the billy ireland yeah sure because like <laughs> there's so much volume of that stuff and it's it's pretty cool stuff you know there's letters and just mm-hmm. every kind of printing you can imagine and there's only so many hours in the day to even like process that and i feel like that might be a place to put it yeah, you so, do what you do, man. I may talk to uh, to Billy Ireland when we're there at CXC and see what their thoughts are on it. Yeah, I just got this back room that is. Uh... That's what my that's what my workspace looked like <laughs> before I, I moved some stuff. Have out. you guys ever thrown out a comic? I don't think Never. so. Yeah. I try not to. There's yeah. always places to to give comics, right? Sure. And and now we do that that kayfabe in uh, yeah. d- in in Christmas right. in July yeah. thing. So like, I actually have. Uh, 
I guess you might as well do it in December, too. I got a good round of stuff that I'm accumulating, by the way. Yeah, you know what? I think that way, too. Now, there were there was some stuff because I'm putting things around. And, like, I've got doubles of things and stuff. And yeah. it's like, oh, yeah, this is one to put into the uh, lending libraries. When we were digging with Fife, I, I, I hit a vein of uh, Joe, Joe Matarera X-Men's. I probably don't have any of those, but do, I don't know do, that do, I do you want them? them. <laughs> like, like, I mean, obviously, you take, take, uh, take whatever you want, and then, like, I'll put the rest. I want to do Black Magic at some point, but I don't have book two. Do you have book two? I don't think I do. I'd have, I'd have to look because that's one of those things that I find. What is that? I, I'm keeping these. These, yeah. these are. This was sent by a, a Sisters in, in Christ. Oh, you know okay, how they yeah. always send us. Yeah, they sent me a Leroy lettering got him. They did, and that's like uh, just a little tip. I love this kind of stuff, like the old design production books. This is a good. This is good stuff. This is this what, is like real info, man. When we were digging with uh, Fife, like they held a bunch of these uh, Adventures into the Unknown with Ogden Whitney's for me and stuff. I went down and grabbed them, and there were actually doubles of this one. Sweet. So, like, if any of you dudes want that, then you can fight for it. <clears throat> yeah, at some point, I want to do some Ogden Whitney something because I have yeah. this book, and it it's um, a reprint of one of his early comics. Yeah. Jump off the top. Cool. And it has like basically the Ogden Whitney story as this guy heard it and it's it's sad it's like everybody you know it's yeah everybody's story yeah. your stock comic book story of like alcoholism and stuff and his wife died and he just kind of spiraled out yeah which is bummer but at least mm -hmm. it's a record of ogden whitten that's true career wise yeah. and uh i don't know he's one of he's a guy i really like his art I, and i think if you're a Klaus fan like there, there's it's not hard to get into ogden whitten yeah like herbie is phenomenal mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah it's an interesting career but it, it does seem to end in tragedy like like, as like they a all few. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know about all of them, but quite a few of them. It's uh, it's like, uh, I think it was in the new, new game in Sandman where there's the writer lady inside the cafe, and it's like, you got to know when to end the story. No, John D says that, right? Yes. Like, you got to know when to end the story, because if you keep following it along, yeah. death death is imminent. Yeah, I suppose that's true. In the end, we all we all end the same way, right? Mark Newgarden. <laughs> we all die alone. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's all about. That's 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 why I got into comics. I don't know about you guys. You know, leave a sexy corpse. You got to yeah. leave something behind. You know. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah, that is the cool thing about it too, man. Just like little Pete. We're gonna have some death talk in in uh, in, sure, in this yeah. issue of uh, Sandman because it has the Hob story, which is yeah, which is very very uh, important comic to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Yeah, Ma uh, Malcolm Jones too is uh, another tragic. Yeah, and I guess so we'll we'll put, we'll we'll just make make note. No, We'll make mention of that because we did that other Sam and stuff had no idea. Right, right, yeah. And then it's the audience that, that sort of hipped us to to uh the tragedy of his his end. The Sandman uh rereading, I suppose, for you guys, Clive Barker intro. Um <clears throat> this is the first time I've read all of Doll's House. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh going forward, like it like I was saying earlier, you know, like I would get Sandman's sporadically yeah. or an artist issue or whatever and so i'd read it like out of order and stuff sure. and it's just not the best way to read not this of kind series. of thing yeah not this kind of thing it's, it's a shame because i piece together so many of these runs and it's like i never go i rarely go back and go like i finally have yeah. all the whispers now let's read them in order right. you know like that part usually doesn't happen i'm do i'm doing that with with several series it's, and, it's yeah. the right thing to do I'm, I'm doing that with thor like i started like a, a youtube thing of thor every thursday because it was like Ooh, how else good. am i going to read all the Thor in order if I don't come up with some kind of structure because I've tried it a bunch of times and like I always stop at some point you know? in, in in prep for, for getting out of here uh, for, for the Japan trip like I'm recording a video a day just to just yeah. to have some padding and I'm going through uh, Preacher the Kitchen Sink Spirit Uncanny X-Men and G.I. Joe G.I. So, Joe so right. that's how I'm just like keeping shit interesting and fun for myself sure. is like one, one, of, one yeah. of these a day. But then I started thinking like, if I do a daily preacher two months in a week, that's the, that's, that's all the preacher, you know, if yeah. I, if I do it that way, man. Um, so it's definitely like we have this, this tool, you know, sure. put it to use a little bit. And then when I come back and stuff and, and we, we get back to business, like I might put those, those vids out like sort of as a second vid in the later part of the day or some shit yeah preacher was a series i read in order that was that was it, it does make a difference and it, it'll be fun I, I have some ideas on that in regards to sandman yeah being series being one story being books yeah i wish that more series were thoughtful like that because right. it doesn't it doesn't work that way uh, all the time
I wonder if that's part of why comics are the way they are today, where it seems like everything is four to six issues. Oh, or yeah, maybe even a little bit. Maybe very, it's eight issues. Very, yeah, there's like very dope they're very finite, and then right it's like new that. creative team. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot to say about that in regards to to this specific issue, man. All right, are you guys uh, yeah. you ready to dive in? Yeah. yeah. Sure. <clears throat> Andrew McNutt going to Japan November 12th through uh, December 10th. The, cl the weather's good out there, too, then, man. It's slightly, slightly, uh, it's jacket weather. Like, even in mid-December, you know, I'm w walking from the second I wake up to time to go to bed. Fucking drip, drench with sweat. When were, what time of year were you there last time? October 1st through November 3rd or 4th. And that early part of October is still fucking hot. Yeah. And, and like substantially like it even had homeboy come come from here to to, to meet me out and, and, and kick it and there were times like his his hotel was kind of further apart so we kind of meet in the middle and uh one time he actually came to my spot and i was like dude you want a shirt you want a fresh shirt man because like i smelled his sweaty ass because it was just so hot i'm like yo you want want to hit of this deodorant we were there in may and i don't remember it being too hot i think there was maybe one or two day but it was like you say like you're out and about all day long but i don't remember it being it's being those bad. summer months man or the bitch it, it's almost like follow the rules of new york you know like like october like november is like the fall is like the beautiful yeah it's time to be there man and yeah. then of course cherry blossom season which would be like march like right. february like like that's sick too that'd be sweet yeah yeah she's going with me for four weeks and then in may for six weeks wow. with, our, with our family and stuff i'm like fuck, i might have to go out just do my own tokyo shit like when you guys are coming into tokyo like reconvene uh a little bit and just kind of do my own thing i don't know we'll see depends on how much red room gets done by then i gotta have it all done by may if i if i ended up doing something like that two issues to do i'm good if you are yeah we didn't need to talk about any of your other comics work this <laughs> week huh you, you, you sent me some good yeah, pictures some this week of some that. other comics. I don't know if that's something you Secret. want to talk about now or no. Yeah, we'll just save it. You can hit up my Instagram. All right, man, whenever you're ready. Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And I'm Tom Scioli. Special guest in the house, Tom Scioli. Before we dive into today's video, I want to remind everybody that we are going to be on the road a lot in October. Catch us the first week. Uh, when you see this video, it'll be a week from now. October 6th through the 9th, we will be in Columbus for CXC. We will have a panel that Saturday from 4 to 5, so come out and support us there. Baltimore Comic Con, October 28th to the 30th, the end of October. Baltimore Con, a good show for comic book fans. I'm excited to go back to that one. It is where we first started, uh, where we conceived of Cartoonist Kayfabe, so it's kind of cool to get back to that site. And you can find me in Jacksonville, October 22nd, at their public library for a comic and zine festival. And as we get into uh, cartoonist Kayfabe Tober, here's a reminder of our prompt list. So do a screen capture there or check out our, uh, our social media to get a list of these prompts and share us if you decide to uh, dip in and out of this or if you decide to try to do all 31 of them, tag us on Instagram or Twitter, wherever you're posting your work, and we will try to uh, signal boost some of those. But it should be a fun month. Looking forward to the uh, cartoonist Kayfabe audience out there. We know they're very creative, see a lot of the work that they do, so... It'll be exciting to dive into that. Can I, can I mention Jacktober, another... Uh, is it is it masturbatory? And, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, isn't all comics. <laughs> and uh, it's it's Jack Kirby-related prompts through the month of October. So if you want to double up. Is that your list, Tom? That, yeah, I put the list together. Sweet. Yeah, I saw I saw that posted. And uh, man, there's a lot of those out there. And you know what I was thinking with this stuff? Because I can never... I can't do 31 of no. these. But now and then I will do a couple. Is... Uh, it's all right to dip in and out of these. I, I disagree. The that you're available. I disagree. You do the kayfabe tober ones, <laughs> and, and you'll be all right. I uh, I make sure to do thirty. Like since I started the Jack Tober one, I make sure to always, and I usually end up doing more than thirty one. Did you guys start the kayfabe tober, or was that a, a fan that did that? Or there were some in the past years. Yeah, we put this, this list this together. List. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we are here to continue our Sandman coverage. Uh, Obviously, Neil Gaiman's Sandman seems to be evergreen yeah, and uh, maybe bigger now than ever with the recent Netflix series. But uh, you guys have both read this entire series. I have not. Mm -hmm. I've kind of dipped in and out of it over the years. So going through and reading it in order has been uh, has been interesting so far. And I, it makes me want to read more. That's one of those criteria we usually get into with some of the books we look at, especially if it's a longer series. Do you want to read the next one? I do. So, you know, tipping my hat a little bit just to start off. 
But this is the second volume, and interestingly, this was the first Sandman collection. I read this this week in The Essentials, and yeah. they talk about that uh -huh. in, uh, in the back matter, about how they were trying... Already, they were seeing like some buzz around Sandman whenever it mm -hmm. first comes out, and they were trying to capitalize on it, and they put together the trade paperback, and they went with the second volume, which pretty bold you know whoever figures that out like that seems like something that you would probably have to uh argue your point to it get that it makes sense open up and and uh you'll see a neil gaiman piece after the clive barker intro i have to take my time just because i love the lettering throughout sure. this yeah. this is really attractive yeah. i know they've done several of these uh collections and i think this design probably changes from collection to collection but uh, I got to say, I really like this, and it feels extremely 1990s, yeah, which, for sure. yeah. you know, that's my nostalgia for design. And uh, So this is the Neil Gaiman piece, I believe, yeah. And uh, what you're seeing in the text here is probably text that was in that original publication, and it is just concisely giving you the information that happens in Preludes and Nocturnes, uh, the, first, the first collection. And if you had the first printing of Doll's House, it would have the the death issue. So it would be issue oh, eight. It would be issue eight through sixteen rather than uh, nine through sixteen, which this is. Uh, so you know because issue eight was a paradigm shift, like that. Like, yeah. A lot of a lot of a different demographic starts coming to Sandman comics thanks to death. Uh, so why not put that heavy hitter like as a as a starting batter? I just saw an Art collection. Adams death uh, pinup. This That's week, uh, you know, there's, this stuff floats through social media and it's like uh, Art Adams doing death. I'll take a look at that. There's the, uh, you know, I've never seen him draw like somebody that doesn't have the biggest bust. You know what I mean? So like death is a very, you know, gaunt kind of goth character. So I want to see how he tries that that body approach, man. But uh, there's a book called The Sandman Gallery mm -hmm. that has like the McFarlane pinup, Jeff Darrow. There's a Jamie Hewlett in there. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Uh, pretty cool. Anyhow, man. Uh, yeah, so issues 9 through 16 are what's collected here. Yeah. And uh, a lot of interesting material. Like, like you know, we'll cover it as we go through in order. But there's, um, I think there's a lot to talk about in yeah. this. One of, one of my big takeaways in this is certainly Neil Gaiman does not shy away from mentioning Alan Moore as the guy who literally taught him how to how to write comic mm -hmm. book scripts. And I see a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, Alan Moore influence through, throughout this book and it'll become more of a Neil Gaiman thing as, yeah. as he gets more and more comfortable but this issue has a has a kind of a Alan Moore rhythm in as much as the bottom tier it's almost like six panel tier like six panel page type thing the bottom tier is always our characters out in the desert um, talking with one another and then the top two tiers will be the story that's being told and that's a that's a that's an Alan Moore sort of pacing, mm -hmm. something that I associate with him bringing bring to comics. Mike Dringenberg and Malcolm Jones III are the artists on most of these issues. I think there's two fill-in issues yeah. uh, with artists. Todd Klein, you've mentioned in the past that how you think he's one of the defining uh, visual voices in Sandman. To Trinity. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of fill-in issues on lettering mm. even. And so when we get to that, we'll, we'll point it out. Um, Robbie Bush, colorist, name I'm not very familiar with, but I like most of the coloring as well so you know like this kind of page to me i love seeing the sand white and then continuing on to almost negative space in the bottom yeah works really well for me and it's very much uh like a fairy tale yeah like a yeah, folk tale yeah mythology mm -hmm. like like i think gaiman's voice is emerging right as you yeah. as you say yeah. or, or his confidence or teller of level. stories yeah yeah totally and i can see how this book gets an audience outside of your traditional i don't even want to say superheroes but just your traditional comic book style of storytelling this feels different. Well, I mean, I was a teenager when I read this. And that was probably the last time I read this stuff. I was still a teenager. So not as versed in like, you know, storytelling or like the comics history and stuff like that. And so a lot of these things I'd read and just assume this is like an actual folk tale. I mean, probably, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've heard some like African folk tales uh, that are kind of in this general vicinity, but I think this is, you know, his, his original creation, but things about the real world when you're reading this comic. I love this visual, like holding up that piece of glass and distorting your eyeball. And also it's a really great, like uh, the, the flow is really strong. As you mentioned, this bottom tier works uh, exceptional. Yeah. And this is kind of a, uh, it's somewhat self-contained, this first story. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. And, and like when you read it the first time, like when I was a kid.